one of the things we learn over time is that God's thoughts and God's views are, are far more complex and far above our own. You know, the old saying, God works in mysterious ways. Remember that saying? Used to describe when things go really strangely, but we believe that somehow God had a hand in that. And we see these truths all the way through the history of God's people. In the Old Testament, we see God working in strange and unusual ways through the New Testament early church and right throughout church history. There are stories of God just doing unexpected things. Just when you think that you have God all figured out, just when you think you've got everything sorted, God kind of turns up in a different way and we clamor around to try and understand and readjust our thoughts in order to relate to how God is moving forward. We establish our traditions. We get our practices all right. We get our doctrines all sorted. We are confident in our worship. We know God and then bam, he turns up and he does something totally unexpected. We're thrown into a tiz and we have to work it out all over again. We have to adapt to what he's doing. And there are a lot of examples of this. Let's take an Old Testament example, the Israelites. In the Old Testament, they're, they're just getting used to uh, God and, you know, they've got their kings and there's good succession of kings. They've got their worship. The temple's running smoothly. All the priests are in place. All the Levites are doing their work. And then suddenly God raises up a foreign army comes into Israel, surrounds Jerusalem, sacks it, grabs the, the nobles and, and the best, the cream of the crop, and carries them off into exile. And suddenly the Jews find themselves in a place where they have no temple. They have no priests to lead them in the worship and the offering and, and the sacrifices. Their festivals are now illegal. And so this is where the culture around synagogue worship began through this time that God brought upon them unexpectedly. A mod, more modern example, not so long ago, most church services were done in Latin. I say not so long ago, I mean relatively. Latin was believed to be you know, the holy language and it. And the church had done that for generations, leading worship in this very beautiful, uh, very respectful and traditional way. But then as, as the, the British Empire started to dominate around the world, English started to become the main language. And it wasn't long before the church realized as the generations went on that a lot of the people couldn't understand anymore the worship and, and the mass. And so they had to adapt and change even their language of church and worship. And again, uh, in even more recent history, we have uh, the Enlightenment comes through and everything in the world changes, and so preaching changes. It becomes very intellectual, and worship was very, very controlled and subdued and strict, and, and they attached reverence to that word. I think you can be reverent without being strict and formal and all of that kind of thing, but that was the word they used. And then about a 100 years ago, a move of the Holy Spirit came through the church, and everything changed. The Holy Spirit began to work in, in new ways. There was a vibrancy and a richness and a robustness in worship. It became louder and, and more enthusiastic and miracles were happening. And God was doing supernatural things and people were experiencing a deep personal touch of the work of God in their lives rather than just knowing about God. And so experience became 
the most important thing. It replaced intellect as the desired qualities for believers. And as it swept across the, the church, it, it changed worship style and music, even methods of evangelism changed and different doctrinal emphasis started coming about. And so we had the, the rise of the charismatic movement, which for many churches was a challenge. Is this from God? Is this not from God? How do we deal with that? And the church started to slowly adapt to get used to the new things that the Holy Spirit was doing. My point here is that God does new things all the time. God is working and moving and breathes freshness into the kingdom of God. He brings freshness into the church. And sometimes our traditions, what we become used to, what we become comfortable they just don't fit anymore. And this brings us to our story today. Now, we are still in chapter 9 of Matthew. So if you want to turn there, this is the third and last uh, message from this series that we've been on called New Wineskins. Just the, this whole concept of God regenerating from the inside out. And we come to our last story that we're going to look at today. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 to 17. And we're looking at the disciples of John today. One day, the disciples of John the Baptist came to see Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we do and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with a groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and they will fast. Besides, who would put a patch of old clothing on new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. Why don't your disciples fast? They asked Jesus. And it was a reasonable question. It wasn't a complicated question. It was a pretty simple question. Why didn't they fast? And we look at that and think, oh yeah, that's a fair enough question. But there's more to this question than meets the eye at first. What were they really asking Jesus and so it'd be good just for us to understand the whole context around that word fasting. And I'd like to uh, just reflect on what that culture was in Jesus' day among the religious people. Now, I know already that probably a great number of you know this, but I think it helps us just to set up our thoughts as we reflect on how Jesus actually responded to this. So fasting was a spiritual discipline. At its core, fasting is a denial of the most basic human need, food, in order and in priority for God, making God more important even than food. And so it, it's a spiritual thing. It's a, it's a switching off of the cravings um, and, and the needs and the desires of the, the human body and turning our full attention toward God. Now, in the Old Testament, fasting was often connected to a number of things. For example, example, fasting was often associated with mourning. Mourning both in terms of losing a loved one, but also mourning in, both, in terms of repentance. And so you've got stories like when Ezra and Nehemiah, they found the law and they read the law. And the people responded to the reading of the law and they fasted and they put on morning clothes and, and they they observe that that time of, of seeking a new f f blessing from God and so fasting was surrounding that uh, sometimes you read about fasting in the area of hope like when there's a need like when something desperate is happening 
and you've run out of your resources. And we've got some Old Testament stories like that. For example, the story of Esther and the Jewish people are in danger. And Mordecai calls for uh, all of the Jewish people to fast and seek God. And you've got the story of Jehoshaphat when he first learns that a vast army is coming against him, one that far outnumbers his. And so his response was to call the people to fast and to pray. We also see it in unique ways, miraculous fasting, fasting, for example, for special, very special moments, uh, like Moses when he went up onto the mountain to get the law, or Jesus when he went out into the desert uh, to have uh, that, that time of testing. And we read about it in those as well. And, <coughs> pardon me, these examples really set fasting up to be really a characteristic of godly people. So if you're a godly person, you would fast. And the traditions of Jesus' day, it really informed them who the spiritual people really were. Now, the Pharisees, as you would probably guess, uh, had lots of rules about fasting. Most devout Pharisees, for example, would fast twice a week, Monday and Thursday. And they would fast, and we read about that in Luke. Uh, Luke 18, you've got that story, remember, of the Pharisee that's praying to God and thanking God that he's not like the sinner and he gives his tithe and he fasts twice a week. And so this was a common pattern. We also know the disciples of John the Baptist fasted too. Uh, in Matthew verse, uh, chapter 11, um, Jesus said, for John didn't spend his time eating and drinking, and you say he's possessed by a demon. He goes on to say, you know, the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton, right? So, so we know Jesus is indicating that John very much took this fasting pattern seriously, and so would his disciples. So in Jesus' day, this is a measure of devotion, which is why they're asking his question. <laughs> why aren't you? Why aren't your disciples doing this? It's a fair question. But their traditions didn't fit on this occasion. Why is that? See, fasting was about getting ready for God to do something. Fasting was a part of consecrating yourself, making yourself clean and pure. It was one of the things they did, apart from you know, washing and all of those other things. And so one of the reasons why John the Baptist was teaching about fasting is they were getting themselves ready. They were consecrating themselves for the kingdom. But here we have John the Baptist's disciples asking Jesus why he's not fasting. But he is there already. He's right with them. He's right in front of them. Why would they continue the religious devotion of old when he's right there? almost as if they hadn't noticed. And we have Jesus' reply here in verse 15. Do wedding guests mourn while they're celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. Straightforward analogy, right? If you go to a funeral, people wear mourning clothes and they, they mourn. When you go to a wedding, people wear wedding clothes and they celebrate the way you are dressed and, and the traditions fit the situation. And Jesus is saying, your traditions that you've based yourself on are actually not fitting with what's currently happening in the kingdom of God. The Son of God is here. The Messiah is here. Whilst John the Baptist called his followers to get ready for the Messiah and for the kingdom, Jesus calls his followers, I am the Messiah, follow me. Yeah, the getting ready was over. The Messiah was now here. It was a time to grow and to learn and to focus and to obey. Now, the people we're focusing on here are actually the disciples of John. So they are religious people, right? These aren't bad people. They're not hypocrites. They're not alternative motives or anything like that. They are not people with positions of power like the Pharisees and the Sadducees had. So they're not bad people. They believe the words of John and they were getting ready for the Messiah. They were waiting. And yet here was Jesus. 
right in front of them. And all as they could see was how he measured up to their traditions. They were religious, to be sure. And we respect them for it, but they were disconnected. They had a devotion, but it wasn't complete. It was directed at God, but it wasn't in step with God. Now we see something similar in a story that occurs a little later on in the New Testament church. It comes from the book of Acts. Also, a group of John the Baptist's disciples in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked them. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Again, we have similar group of people, disciples of John the Baptist. But the church had been born again. The kingdom of God had come and the new covenant had been ushered in. And the Holy Spirit had brought this new covenant into the individual hearts of the believers. Yet these believers, the disciples of John, were not aware that, that the people of God had been born again. And they were still adhering to religious tradition as soon as they finally understood of course they experienced the same baptism of the spirit that the apostles had now instead of just honoring god by their traditions and practices they had the holy spirit dwelling in them it's not hard to miss god's work all we have to do is be so focused on what we know that we become unwilling to see anything new that God is doing. I'll say that again. All we have to do to miss what God is doing is to become so focused on what we know already that we become unwilling to experience anything new that God is doing. And even worse, we sometimes view the new thing that God is doing with suspicion and judgment. Now, we have seen this in the past when, when the Holy Spirit is working in an unusual way and many people will pass judgment on that because it doesn't fit into their traditions. I see this on YouTube all the time, where one senior Christian leader will criticize another senior Christian leader because they don't fit into uh, the paradigm that they believe they should. And so you've got Christians criticizing Christians, not really able to understand what God is doing. And so we try to squeeze God into this mold, and every time we do, we run the risk of eventually destroying our faith and, sadly, our witness. There is a story that illustrates this, and it's a Queensland story. I know of a church. I won't name it. I take a risk because I'm online here this morning. But there is a Queensland church that their two denominations merged, and they formed one church. And in that church, the two different denominations that merged had different practices of communion. And so one of them had communion every Sunday. The other group had a communion only once a month. 
And so what they did when they combined is on the weeks where all of them had communion, they had communion in the service, and on the weeks where the others thought that they shouldn't have communion, they left the church and the other ones stayed for communion. They were using the communion of the Lord Jesus to divide the church, all because one group was used to having it once a month and one group was used to having it every week. Now, none of that is biblical. That was all tradition. And they were dividing the church by their tradition. If you truly believe that God can only work within the parameters that you have set and according to your favorite and cherished doctrines, then you will never have the capacity to receive what God has for you. That's what Jesus means when he says this next thing in verse 16. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins, so that they are both preserved. God cannot lead you on a new spiritual trail if you believe that the, only, the, the road you're on is the only way. God cannot fill you with a fresh experience of the Holy Spirit if your heart is fixed only on what you're currently confident in. Now, I can hear the caution among you. I can't hear it out loud, but, you know, it's there. But, Brett, shouldn't we be very careful about keeping our doctrine pure? Shouldn't we be careful about making sure that we check everything and test it against the Bible. After all, there had been many, many false doctrines or nuances of doctrines that have taken people down harmful paths. And, and Brett, what about the excesses, these, these embarrassing excesses where, where people have gone and done erratic and crazy things in the name of the Holy Spirit? And I would say, yes, of course, make sure your doctrine is right. There is false doctrine out there, and we need to make sure that what we're teaching and preaching is true and it's correct. You do have to be discerning in every new expression and movement. But the call here is to be biblical, not traditional. There is a difference. We are not called to safeguard and protect our traditions or our culture or even democracy for that matter. We're not called to do that. We're called to reflect accurately what the Lord teaches us through the Bible. The only command for fasting was on the Day of Atonement. Everything else that John's disciples did, everything that the Pharisees did, was an observation of only human tradition. Jesus wasn't teaching against fasting and he wasn't disobeying the law either. He was just saying that the disciples didn't fast because they were in a renewed season of serving and fasting wasn't appropriate for now. They would later, but not for now. Jesus instead was bringing in the kingdom of God. He was about to establish a new covenant, a covenant not based on the law and tradition, but a covenant based on grace and faith, a covenant not of external rituals, but of inner spiritual renewal of the heart, a covenant not centered around Jerusalem, but a covenant centered around the gospel that would spread right throughout the world. He speaks of 
new wineskins, a new season, and a new capacity for the people of God to be able to move with this message of the gospel into all cultures, Gentiles and, and everywhere. And I think it's no accident that Matthew now includes four stories. Now, we didn't read these uh, in, in the Bible reading at first, but uh, many of you will be familiar with these. And I think by including these four stories so close to the three um, messages that we have just done, it's almost like Matthew is using these stories to illustrate what these new wineskins actually look like. The new kingdom operates in a totally different way. And so he goes on now to tell four stories. I'm not going to unpack these stories for you. I'm just going to refer to them. So from verse 18 on, they're not up on the slide. So if you already opened your Bible, you'll see that there are four stories that illustrate what I believe Jesus means when he says new wineskins. We have four healings. We have the synagogue ruler whose daughter had passed away. And Jesus went to his house and he raised her to life again. We have the woman that had a bleeding sickness. And she went up and touched Jesus and she was healed. We have the two blind men uh, that received their sight. And we had the demon possessed man who was mute, and Jesus released him and healed him. And what's common in all of these four stories is the element of the power of faith. It was a foretaste of what faith would look like in the new covenant. The woman, for example, was healed not because she made an offering at the temple and not because she prayed a certain prayer. She was healed because she believed if she just touched his robe, that the power of God would, would bring healing to her. It was her faith that made her well. The blind men were told by Jesus that it was their faith that healed them. The daughter was raised to life, not because the father was necessarily a good Jew, but that he believed in Jesus enough to go get him and bring him to heal her. The demon-possessed man was healed, but an interesting narrative twist Matthew focuses on the unbelief of the Pharisees who saw the miracle but missed the point. Jesus is teaching us that there is a way of faith devotion that goes past the tradition that God's people had known up until then. It steps bravely into the breach of ordinary life, trusting God through it, no matter how challenging. A faith that is focused not on religious ritual or tradition, but on a person, the Lord Jesus. A life of faith that has the capacity for God to do new things, different things that stretch us beyond what we are used to. This is the kingdom of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The question today shouldn't be, when is God going to do a new thing? Because he's always doing new things. For anyone willing to grow, God will lead you into the next step of faith in your life. If you truly value trust and obedience above comfort and safety, then you'll keep your freshness in the spirit. If you open your heart to listen to what God might be showing you, you will learn new things. And this leading in the spirit will help you to get to know him better. This is what spiritual growth is all about. I would hope that our testimony is not buried in some story of long ago. I would hope that our testimony is current, that we would have new things to say 
about what God is doing in our life, that we would be able to, with great confidence and with perfect examples, answer that question, how do you know God is real? Because he's in my life. Let me tell you a story just about just last week. That's what I think spiritual maturity is about. Spiritual maturity is not only about how much you know. It's also about who you know. It is that relationship that makes us strong. So I'm going to leave you with another challenge this week. I've delivered some challenges to you. This won't happen every single week, right? I'll challenge you to exhaustion if I do that. I hope what you understand I'm trying to do is set up habits. So the challenge I gave you in week one, I hope you're still kind of doing that. And the challenge I gave you last week about, you know, when you're in a crowded place or you're walking in a place and you see people that stand out to you, either negatively or positively, that you just ask God, how can I pray for them? These things become a habit. And here's another one. Some of you might already do this, but I just want to refine it a little bit. I want you to choose a time in the week, just one time in the week, right? So this is, I'm not talking about daily devotions that many of you are in the habit of doing. I'm talking about a reflection here. Choose a time in the week. I would recommend kind of the end of the week, perhaps Sunday afternoon or maybe Sunday after church might be a good time. To choose that time, uh, grab a journal or a booklet or, or in your phone somewhere and each week get into the habit of uh, writing in the journal, uh, dating it. So, you know, week ending the 5th of November 2023 and answer these four questions by writing down your answer in your journal. But answer them honestly. Firstly, what is God saying to you this week? Now, you might be able to point to a Bible verse that stood out to you because you were reading in your Bible and something stood out. Or while you're praying, God put something on your heart and you felt it was from him. You might write that, that down. Maybe you were too busy this week and you just didn't get around to spending time. And so you write, God didn't say anything to me this week. Now, you don't have to do that too many times before you seek to change your habits. Either you'll stop journaling or you'll start doing something about God speaking in your life. The next question that follows, so you're looking at a page that's divided up into four, right? The next question that follows is, how are you responding to what God's saying? <laughs> so if God's not speaking to you because you're not taking the time to listen, then you're not going to be responding. That's not what the discipleship looks like, right? So it's a challenging question as well as an affirming one, as you are honest about how you're responding to him. The third question, how has God used you recently? This is a question that keeps in front of you that the fact that uh, our purpose here is to serve him. How is he using you? And how have you stepped out in faith recently? Where have you taken a, a risk for God? Or taken a spiritual step that took courage and you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. I'll guarantee you that if you make a habit of doing this, it will keep you in relationship. Now, I'm not trying to set up a tradition, right? There's not an irony here in what I'm saying. These are just habits that keep us connected so we don't think that we're so spiritual because we're in tradition. It's an easy trap to be in. I think some of you, if you do this, you'll be probably encouraged that you're more mature and closer to God than you thought you were. Some of you, when you do this, you'll realize, my goodness, I thought I was walking with Jesus, but I realized there's more areas to grow in. Both are good things. The trick will be making this into a habit, and that's why I'm going to pray for you now to help us to do that. Uh, it is a habit that I do, and I have found it to be most valuable in terms of keeping check of my current testimony. So let 
us pray and uh, ask God about this. Heavenly Father, we know that through the Spirit, you've given us great and precious privileges. I'm sure we can't as humans understand the fullness of what it means to have your Spirit dwelling in us. But Lord, there is no end to the growth that you would have in our spirit as we walk in cooperation with you. And we thank you for that beautiful gift. And I pray that in the spirit, as we take the time to listen, to read your word and listen to what your spirit might be speaking, that we would grow, that you would show us what to do. That as we take the courage to put into action the things that you're telling us that we would learn how to get those instincts right that over time lord you would teach us how to tell the difference between your spirit's voice and our own imagination that you would teach us how to recognize fear when it pops up its head and to learn to overcome that by faith i pray lord that the outcome of all of this would be that we have stories to tell when anyone should ask us the reason for our faith that we can express with genuine and honest stories about what you are doing currently in our life. Be real in us, Lord. And I pray for us as a family, Lord, that as, as many of us will take this on, that you begin also then to speak into us as a group, as a church, that we will together be able to listen and discern to make it not so hard for you, Lord Jesus, to bring change and revival and renewal. Oh, Lord, bring a freshness among us as we conclude this story on you, wineskins. Let us be fit for what you're doing in Harvey Bay, in our workplaces, among our neighbours and in our homes. I pray, Lord, for the power of your spirit to do a transforming work within us that is not achievable through tradition or rituals, but only through surrendering to you by grace and through faith. We pray this for your glory, Lord Jesus, and for the advance of the gospel. Amen. <laughs>